I started this show uh, to highlight people like you who are so creative. I call it the Creative People Show because I don't want to limit it to entertainment or um, um, acting or singing or, or music. Uh, cause, but there's a lot of that around here. A lot of people like that uh, who are coming, going to be coming on the show. Uh, but I want people in the arts, uh, you know, the physical arts, uh, the uh, dance, um, comedy, uh, and not just that, but anybody who's um, got creative ideas about math, science, you know, innovations. That reminded me, I just reminded myself what, <laughs> what uh, you're talking about music, and some people think, you know, that's, mo that's all creativity, but as you well know, <laughs> Music is math. This is one of my spiels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you've heard me give this, this well, speech I've, before. I don't know if I've heard you, but I've said it for years. Music is math. You have timing, time signatures, you know, uh, it's four, even four times. It's yeah. even deeper than that. I know. It's, it's a lot more so than that. But musical frequency. Right. Okay. Right. If you 440 look, uh, tuning on the guitar, 440 hertz. Uh, yep. And yeah. so everything is numbers. You mm -hmm. know, um, uh, math is universal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, that's why it's the universal language mm -hmm. across all languages. Um, and in fact, you, you watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And they have the, the <laughs> right. That's because those were frequencies, yeah. musical frequencies that were a way for them to communicate with us and for us to communicate with them. I mean, it's a movie. Don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a movie. But it just shows that it doesn't matter where you're from. The, those numbers don't ever change, and so if we understand the uh, the frequencies of the of the notes, right, and then what we call intervals, which is the distance between the notes on on th the staff, right, you can take each one of those and write the frequency next to it, mm -hmm. and then get the actual mathematical uh, uh, interval yeah. between those. Now, okay, so my grandfather's a math with a math, was a math professor. Oh, okay. okay. And I never had that discussion with him. Yeah. But as I as I started to learn music, there were so many things that I was like, these things line up. Why, right? And and I'm and I'm not the greatest musician at all, right? I I mean I I read music, but I don't sit down and sight read like some of these phenomenal piano players do, right? Yeah. I just I, I can't do it. But I look at it and I go, oh, I know why. I understand why. Like now when I play trumpet, I don't play it as a B flat instrument. I play it as a C instrument, even though it's mm. tuned as a B flat instrument. Really? So the fingerings are all completely different than oh, I learned okay. 20 years ago because I don't want to have to think in B flat. Yeah. I just want to play in C. C, no because sharps, no flats. That's right, because the guitar yeah. is a C instrument. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, I always joke, you know, you know, why is the guitar better than the piano? It's because there's no black keys. <laughs> and, it's be, and and you know and, and I should somebody get offended when I was I, I oh. told that joke and they got offended and I was like wow way too it's, sensitive one yeah, it's two cool. it's it's the 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 no black keys joke is there's no there's they're all half steps yeah, yeah. everything on the instrument's a half step uh -huh. um, on a on a guitar or, or a violin or a, a double bass or a dobro the string length is the length it is mm -hmm. and you are shortening the length of the string to get your tone right. On all the wind and brass instruments, you are elongating the instrument to get the tone mm -hmm. by by you know you know pushing down a valve, the valve or 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 you know putting your fingers down on a pad for a sax or an, uh, or a clarinet. You are lengthening the instrument, which is really funny because that's not the way they teach it in school. Mm -hmm. And I think if they if they taught it as a this is how the, the 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 instrument is structured, why it does what it does, I think kids would have uh, would understand the instrument better mm -hmm. and know how to operate it without prompting in on paper yeah. of music. Yeah. Be able to be, oh, oh, well, I understand, well, those intervals are just this because right. this is why the instrument works the way it does. And I think some of the ways that they've been teaching it for the last hundreds of years, right, that we've had some of these instruments, um, they've boiled it down to be easy for the instructor yeah. Because in a lot of cases, the instructor does not think of the instrument in those ways. Right. They, you know, I think of it as math, mm -hmm. as this is why the building works the way, it, this is the why the tool and Maybe happens. that's, maybe that, I just answered my own question about being a logical, literal person and a musician, 
they kind of go together because uh, the math portion of it. There are drawbacks. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are drawbacks. One of those is I don't feel that I'm very creative. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm not much of a songwriter. Yeah. Like you know, you know, music and lyrics. Uh, you know, you know, I'm I'm okay You've at, at the music part, and I've written some songs. I don't think they're any good. Um, my opinion, right? My family has written some great songs, mm-hmm. and um, and I've played some of them for you, and we've you know, and we've pulled yeah. some out on stage, yeah. and they've gotten decent reactions. Like so it. some people are really creative, and it Your takes sister. all. Oh, my sister, sister's phenomenal. Sister's a great. My sister is a great you know, songwriter and singer. I, I, I guess I played that. That's where I'll be yeah. for you, didn't I? Yeah. She wrote uh, that. When you, you and her played at the Bluebird Cafe. Yep, in Nashville. In Nashville, the, the indomitable uh, Bluebird Cafe. I'm not sure. And I was the right way outclassed there. It was, yeah. I, I, I would I love to it. play there. It was, you know, the Bluebird is a great place because it's, they have a, for those of you that don't, that don't know, they have a Monday night songwriter night. Ah. And what you do is you go on, mon- on a Monday and you sign up and you hope you get on that date, and you won't because there's a lot of people. Yeah. And but they put your they put your name on the list, and that's a, it's a ever revolving list. So what you do is you come back the next week, uh-huh. and you'll play. Yeah. And so I went down the. You know, so if you live too far away, you're gonna make two long trips to get down there unless you stay. Or away. you decided you you know you, a big part of what the Bluebird is is for new songwriters to show up and get noticed. Yeah. Because there's A and R people, you know, publishing, you know, people from the publishing companies that will come in, and it's also a great place for established songwriters to try out new things. Right. Yeah. Right. And and to be inspiring for the new people to come in, and so it's a it's, it's a big networking thing. Yeah. Um, I was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky at the time. Right. Well, right across the border. Yeah, right across the border, and my mom and sister were. Uh, working in Nashville at the time. So when Radio City had their, what called the traveling shows, the road shows. Mm-hmm. So they had the big show in, in New York um, where they had two troops of, of, of singers, dancers, and, and uh, uh, ancillary people, right, for mm-hmm. the shows. But then they had road shows. And so for several years, there was a show in Branson at the Grand Palace, which is now the aquarium. That's oh, down yeah, there. yeah. And... Um, and there was a show in South Carolina, and I know there were like three. And then they'd move. So, you know, you'd, you'd do like four weeks in this location, and then you'd move to the other place and do another four weeks. And so my mom and sister worked that from 1997 until it clo- until they stopped doing the, the road shows, I think, three or four years ago. Um, so they did that show, and the, the company they worked for provided the animals for the, the living nativity scene. So... Mm-hmm. Um, they were in Nashville at the uh, at the Grand at the Grand Old Opry. They were at Opryland doing the show, and I just happened that I was stationed nearby, and everything was great. We were able mm-hmm. to go down, but I got to between my enlisted time and officer time, I got to work the show in Branson and yeah. met some outstanding people, and uh, but I, I still you know in contact with some of them now, and there's all sorts of people in life that you know float around with all sorts of different talents and different personalities. And, and the key is, j- just like you've seen with this project, is to be able to pluck them out and go, you know, oh, I'm going to use a little bit of this and a little bit of this. I'm going to yeah. learn all these different things and figure out who you have as assets to, to utilize their talents and mm-hmm. be there for them when they need you for your talents. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about growing up. Now, you, you were in a whole different level. Uh, you had music in your blood uh, because you were surrounded by it mm-hmm. from the time you were born. Uh, I was kind of the same way, but on a much lower level, uh, both sides of my family, everybody either played an instrument or sang. So when we got together for family reunions and things like that, everybody brought their instrument and sang, and mostly bluegrass and gospel and country stuff. But uh, I, uh, so I had no choice but to have an appreciation <laughs> for music, yeah. you know. and. Uh, and I, I often say this, I don't just play music, I feel music. I don't know about you. That's, uh, to me, it's an emotional thing, too. Uh, whenever I'm singing, that's why sometimes I sweat so much whenever I'm on stage. I'm just, it's coming out my pores, you know. I don't know. When everything's working right, yeah, it's phenomenal. Yeah. And, and my dad used to say, there's an energy that flows through entertainers. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you're singing or playing or whatever, yeah. 
the sweet and spot. And so, yeah, and it's it, it it's it's absolutely amazing. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I have a wireless mic, right? And, <laughs> and a wireless on my guitar. Yeah. You know, Stephen knows when I'm playing yeah. guitar solos. If I know I'm gonna, if I'm gonna take a long one, I'm going in the audience. Um, yeah. There he goes. I see him going. Yeah, there he's he going to go around at least. Is twice. he coming back? I don't know when he's going to come and, back. You know? And uh, and I'll go out there and you know not mess with people, but yeah. but make Engage them the part audience. of the show, right? Yeah. And so as a as a singer growing up, and I used to watch my dad do this. And, you know, he'd go out in the audience, and you could f- you can feel the energy in your body, right? And it's not excitement. It's it's not the same thing. There there is a um, in martial arts um, it, you call it chi. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, depending on where, where, you know <laughs> what what continent you're or country you're dealing with for martial arts, um, yeah. y- you know, in, in, in hapkido, it's a it's key, mm-hmm. right, and it's it's this energy that you're bringing up from the ground through your feet mm-hmm. into your body, and then you're sending it through your your appendage, yeah. right, to your target, right. In music, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. You are you are pulling the energy in from around you from the room and you are putting it through your voice Mm -hmm. or through your instrument to the craft. Yeah. I know it sounds really weird, but it's there. And I have, I have actually walked around in the audience singing and touched people and watched and, and, and looked in their eyes and, and watched the energy move from my body through my hand into their body. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Kid, you're like, you're like, I was like, "Yep, I got gotcha. you." Yeah. And, and you and you move on. And so, when when you're performing, th- that performance, you can be a singer and just stand there and sing, or play guitar and just stand there and play guitar, right? But when you're performing, what you're doing is you're actually taking that energy and giving it away. You're taking you're taking yeah. the emotion of that ballad, and you're and you're you're focusing it on this person and then this person. You're not just blanketing the crowd. You can't do that. I know mm-hmm. I'm not like one of those super Tai Chi masters, <laughs> right? Um, and, and uh, but y- you know, you, you, you focus on someone in the crowd and you, and you give them the energy. Yeah. And, and on the, but the same respect is you're getting the energy from them, mm-hmm. right? Exactly. From their, enge- from their engagement, from their enjoyment, from their love and it's really hard to sing a love song when you're not feeling it. Mm-hmm. it you, you know, you're going through them. You know, I said they're when going the through the motions. Is just disinterested, and, and I, I get that. And down at the at the show in Branson, especially acting and, and doing a show like that, when we're supposed to be interacting with the audience, if they're not interacting, it's much harder for us to to do what we need to do because we like that reciprocal energy. You know, everybody loves playing big shows, right? Mm-hmm. You know, with ten thousand people. I've done it. Right, and they're they're great. Yeah. They're not as much fun as playing a small theater, or even a bar if they're having fun. If they're having, yeah. If they're, if they're having they're fun, you it. know, and and where yeah. people are engaged and they they want to be there. I mean, that's I mean, everybody hates paying a cover, but if you're paying money to be there, you want to be there, right? Yeah. You know, if you're you know if you just walk into a bar and you're there to drink, they're there to drink. They're not there to have fun with you. Yeah. And I've, I've done it to you on stage where I felt something from the crowd that was, that was not on the list. Uh-huh. Right. And I would turn around and just sometimes not even call the song and I <laughs> just, just start, start to playing. play something yeah. and the band has to pick it up yeah. and Ancient. it ends up being the right thing yeah. because the, all of a sudden the crowd reacts to that, yeah. that thing that's outside the norm. And I, I, I played, this has been several years ago, but when I was still on active duty uh, up at Fort Leonard Wood, I would come down and do fill-in shows with bands because they needed a guitar player. Yeah. And we were playing a bar here, and there was a lady and her kids that were in there. They were pl- playing pool or something. And I felt that what we were doing was not the right thing to catch her, right? We were playing to the rest of the room, but I hadn't caught her yet. Yeah. And so I, it popped in my brain to do Walking on Sunshine, which is a crazy uh-huh. tune from the what, eight, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And, uh, by the way, I, I, the, the band didn't have a clue, right? And I was trying to hit, do her an A, okay? And I, and I kicked the tune out. And, by the way, I've never performed, I'd, I'd never performed it before, uh-huh. before that. It just seemed like the right thing. 
<laughs> and she put her stick down and walked over to the front of the stage and was like, oh my God, I was just thinking about that song. Oh, wow. Okay? And I was uh, like, I, I just owned you. Uh -huh. Okay? Yeah. And, you know, and, and at that you point, fan. for the rest of the yeah. night, she was engaged. Right? And so it's about, it's about reading the crowd. It's about finding the one guy in the back here like this. Yeah, Sorry, I just yeah. messed up your mic. Um, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, the guy with the arms crossed in the back, all disgruntled that his wife drug him to the show, right? Yeah. That guy, that uh -huh. guy's in trouble because I'm going to own that person. Uh -huh. I'm going to either make them hate me for the rest of their life or I'm pulling them into the show, right? Yeah. And it's all about reading the crowd. And some people get away with it. Some people can't. Mm -hmm. I've had people not like it. Uh, and I've, and I've, and I've also gotten fans for life. Mm -hmm. And it's, I learned how to do that stuff from my dad. Mm -hmm. I learned how to read a crowd. I learned how to structure a show. I learned how to, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't know if any of your other guests would ever say anything about this, but w why you structure a show the way you do, right? It's a, a show is a story. Mm -hmm. It has yeah. a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. Okay. And if you're just doing a bar show, you know, you catch their attention, you keep them interested, and then you take a, and then you, you know, you hit them with something hard and you take a break, right? Yeah. But when you're doing a show in a theater or a, a concert venue, right? It's a, it's truly a story. Yeah. You are, you are taking them on an emotional journey, in order to, um, in order to elicit a, a specific emotional response, right? When we were playing veteran shows, you know, veterans unions all over the country. Um, yeah, you, you know, you're playing for the people that have been there for, you know, five or six years. Yeah. But that's not the important, that's not the important uh, audience member. Mm -hmm. The important person is the person that's been there. This is their first time. Yeah. And, and a lot of you know that, you know, Vietnam vets had a really hard time when they came home from Vietnam. And they, you know, many guys never even told their families or their wives they were, they were Vietnam vets. Because they were, they were told to be ashamed of their service. Right. And it was not until we built the, you know, the wall was built. Right. Um, and, and we started having Vietnam veterans unions, right? That when he says the wall, he means the, the Vietnam, Vietnam veterans, veterans, veterans memorial. Washington. Yeah. The wall, Vietnam veterans memorial. Washington wall State. is something else. To yeah. More recently. Anyway. Uh, well, see. okay. <laughs> um, for, for, for vets, we know the wall as the one yeah, in DC, right? Exactly. Um, and I, I, and festival was the only group in history to ever set up and play on top of the wall. Wow. And we did that in 92 at the 10th anniversary of the, the dedication. You of the mentioned wall. to me one of the scenes in Forrest Gump yeah. was portraying And I can a send you the footage scene, for that. Yeah. Uh, that actually. Yeah, so what they was did was the. So if you've seen. I'm, you've probably seen the movie Forrest Gump, right? And so all the. All of the, the sequences in that movie are, all have historical significance yeah, yeah. the guy that ran across the united states multiple times i remember that in the 80s yeah. right um but and you know of course we did have a guy that went to china right and beat the chinese playing ping pong mm -hmm. but the the vietnam part of the story and the medal of honor um and the speech is all based off of off of one man mm -hmm. and his name is samuel davis he's from um well he lives in in, in freedom indiana if i remember correctly now um and he was a, a, a Medal of Honor recipient that had his actions in 1967. He was an artillery man at Firebase Cudgel. And I, I first met him in 82 when I was a little kid. I got pictures of him and, and, uh, and Al Lynch and Gary Wetzel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were in contact with the people that were doing the um, National Salute 2 concert which at the mall. Uh, in 84, which was also the dedication of the Three Fighting Men statue, the, 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 w which is one of the statues near the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in D.C. Mm -hmm. And so Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons were playing, and they had us set up in front of Frankie Valley, and we did our show, and then we held the stage before Frankie Valley could come on so Sammy Davis and Gary Wetzel could come up and talk about live prisoners of war and missing in action yeah. in Southeast Asia. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, we only got the official list of prisoners back in 75 when they mm -hmm. you know, released all the prisoners. Yeah. Um, 
there were many more that were kept in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia mm -hmm. um, that, or in some cases, were taken back to Russia uh, to, in, to be interrogated. Uh, and those records were, when the Berlin Wall fell, and we were able to get into the Soviet right. uh, records, we were able to get records for some of those guys. And uh, the, the Vietnam vets are old now. You know, they're in their you know, 70s and 80s. Yeah. And th there are still some there, there. Um, and they probably speak Vietnamese or Cambodian or whatever. Yeah. And they probably don't even think about America because they've mm. been there for so long. Been you know, at a certain point, you go from being a prisoner to being one yeah. of the, you know, just the Locals. gringo in the community. Yeah. Um, but so we were, so we played and, and, you know, and Sammy and you know, Sammy read the speech and Gary held the, with his one arm and his hook, held the, held the paper. Um, and they, the secret service did unplug the power. Um, and a man named Juggle Jim Gano, he's from uh, Cherokee, Iowa. Uh, on the video, you can see him coming through the crowd in a yellow hat, yeah. climbed the scaffolding and plugged it back in and held the soundboard so we, <laughs> so they could give the speech. Um, and that speech is available on YouTube if you go through and look for it. Nice. Um, what they did was when they were doing, when they were making the Forrest Gump movie, they took Sammy's story and they, they used it for the Vietnam stuff. And uh, in fact, that is his footage in the White House with the, them pin, pinning the medal on or, or you know, you know, putting the ribbon around his neck that they took, they took Sammy out of the, the footage and put Tom Hanks in it. Yeah. And no, he didn't bend over and show his butt to the president. <laughs> um, but he did get hit in the butt. Uh, um, and his his citation, his story is amazing. And if you'd like to know more about the real Forrest Gump, Sammy Davis, um, his book is on all the different platforms, you know, whether yeah. it's Barnes & Noble or, or Amazon or whatever. Um, and it's called, uh, you don't lose until you quit trying. It's his, his book. Hmm. Um, and he has, he's an amazing, he's an amazing story. And I've, and he's still alive and he's still alive. I nice. saw him last year. You know, we always, when I do the announcements before the show down there, I always, uh, recognize veterans. And the other night we had, and these are v getting very scarce, a world war two veteran yeah. in the audience. And, uh, we always get several uh, Vietnam vets and uh, you can tell from their hats, you know, uh, some guys don't wear hat right most of the older old world war ii and, and vietnam and uh maybe korea will have a hat on signifying such but we always like to do that there's a lot of show. like i said there's a lot of vets that their families didn't know they were in mm -hmm. right and and part of it was they were ashamed and so when they come out to a veterans union or even more importantly like a fair played a lot of state and county fairs over yeah. the years and you'd have you know, at the end of our show, well, throughout our show, we're doing things for veterans. We're doing stuff that's in their, in their musical timeline, right? Yeah. And what you're trying to do, it goes back to that emotion piece, that mm -hmm. story. What you're doing is you're, the guys that are out of the closet as veterans, you, you, yeah. you got them. You got them hooked in the beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the ones that aren't, um, what you're doing is you're building them up to then at the end of the show, when you have all the vets stand up, and then they stand up. Yeah. yeah. And I've had I'm, and I, more times than I will ever be able to remember. Guys come up either to me or my father, usually my father, because he was the front man of the band, and just said, uh, uh, I've, never, I've never admitted any of that in my life. And wow. my family never knew. And, in, you know, and then you'll see him, you know, at a, at a, at a reunion somewhere or at the, you know, the American Legion Convention. It, mm -hmm. You know, we play that many times. And... If we can't help people, right? Playing music's fun, right? It, it's mm -hmm. fun, but it has to have a purpose. And just like it you can know, be cathartic. A, you know, a previous guest, you know, was talking about how, you know, when he he changed from writing uh, about things he wanted to write about, and then started writing for, uh, for you, know, you know, glory to God, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's very similar, where, you know. It, 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 it can be a, it's a purpose. It's a, you know, it can be a religious experience. It's about helping and taking care of others. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if it wasn't for the way the world war two vets raised their children, mm -hmm. which then became the Vietnam vets. Yeah. Right. And then the way, because of the way the Vietnam veteran was treated when they came home, they decided they were never going to let that happen again. Mm-hmm. 
and then the the first Gulf War happened, right, in 1991, and the treatment of our military when they came home was 180 degrees yeah. of what of what we had before, and that is because of the Vietnam veteran, exactly because of the brotherhood and sisterhood that that was developed through those reunions, mm -hmm. where guys were and girls were able to come together and put their arms around each other and cry were, and have emotion that they were never allowed to show to their families before, right? They're not allowed to show it at home in their community because it's a, it's a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. And being around people that are like you and it has nothing to do with religion or color, it's the culture mm -hmm. of being veterans. of honor to what is best of man I found a crying mother with flowers in her hand she said that she was there because her son was ten years gone another life that was not spared in a place called Vietnam She turned to me and said, young man, please take me in your arm and walk with me on past the wall. I want to see them all. A special place this is to me, but it's taken them so long to say his life was not in vain in a place called Vietnam. Son, it hurts me deep inside. The price we pay for freedom, son, is the highest price of all. The price we pay for freedom, son, is written on. What is best of man? I found a crying mother with flowers in her hand. didn't lose. Everyone needs to know. We didn't lose. Now let's have peace. That's what we fought for. <laughs>